Okay, so let's get started. Now that we haven't resolved the uh, interface snafu with these adapters, <laughs> that's okay. I think we'll, we'll go with the HDMI and see how, how it behaves. Exactly, yeah, I think. I don't, I don't know why all of these things are so hard to deal with. I think we shouldn't be at this stage in, in technology, <laughs> but we are. That's okay. Uh, okay, so we've covered a lot on reliability, and uh, actually there were some slides on DRAM refresh that have more information, but I'll leave that with you. It's in, it's in lecture two slides. So today, right now, we're going to start processing in memory, another direction that's fascinating to me, and hopefully there'll be a lot of good discussion here also. So remember, we were following four key directions to begin with. Uh, we've talked about the first one. We're going to talk about something that covers the next two in some way, and we're going to talk about low latency even more after that. Uh, and as, if you remember, this was something that didn't receive a lot of attention for a long time in memory. I'll go back to Maslow. I said that I was going to de deconstruct this, and now I'm going to deconstruct it. I said we had to start with security and reliability. But you may argue that everlasting energy is, is even more important than security or reliability because this may be your security and reliability, right? If you don't have any energy, maybe you don't care about your security and reliability also. And that's a very basic need as well. So I think the basic question that I'll ask is do we want some future like this or do we want some future like this? 1940s Pittsburgh, maybe. <laughs> I think the, not many people will take this one. Uh, so uh, I have actually have a much longer lecture on in-memory computation. I, I usually motivate it from two perspectives. One perspective is uh, the need for, basically I motivate the need for intelligent memory controllers. One perspective you already covered. Today we're, we're sandwiched between two kinds of trends that are pushing us to have intelligent memory controllers. One is a bottom-up trend. There's a huge push from circuits and devices that require these intelligent controllers to solve the problems associated with the devices or to solve the problems associated with the technology. Like if you have hybrid memories, it's good to have an intelligent controller. And those are trends that are coming from bottom, bottom up, from the technology layer, from the circuit layer, pushing us to have more intelligence in the memory controller. There's also a top-down trend that we briefly discussed, but we're going to talk a little bit more about. There's a huge pull from systems and applications that require us to, have, to do something more intelligent with memory. And today, I think we're squished between those two trends that, uh, in my opinion, make uh, intelligent memory controllers a necessity as opposed to a luxury. And this idea of processing inside the memory or processing near memory is a very, very old idea. It's been there for, since the analog computers, and people have, been, have kept on proposing it in database machines, early database machines, for example. In the late 1970s, people wanted to have non one Neumann architectures, the non one database machines, an example, that tried to push processing in memory. But the idea never took off, in my opinion, because we never were squished between these two trends. So today, uh, I hope I motivated the need for intelligence from the bottom up. Let's talk about the top down a little bit, and then we're going to cover processing in memory in two directions, maybe different from what was proposed in the past, because I don't think some of the things that were proposed in the past are going to be feasible. Uh, into the future, given that memory and logic are not necessarily uh, compatible technologies with each other. Uh, and we're going to cover two different directions. And then we're, uh, hopefully we'll get to some adoption issues, which are very interesting. Uh, a lot of these are system level issues uh, to enable processing in memory. So that's the uh, plan of action. So the observation and opportunity is uh, high latency and high energy is caused by data movements. Uh, and I've quantified that. You have long energy-hungry interconnects, energy-hungry electrical interfaces, and we have huge amounts of data moved in the system. And I motivated that with the example application that I mentioned at the very beginning in, uh, yesterday. The opportunity is we can minimize that data movement by performing computation directly where the data resides as opposed to going through these huge interconnects, huge inter electrical interfaces, and moving a lot of data. This is... I'm going to reuse uh, these terms interchangeably, processing in memory, in-memory computation or processing, near data processing. There are, of course, levels of being near data. How close are you to the data? Are you really inside where the data is or are you a little bit outside? 
a little bit outside, a little bit outside. Like when does this end? There are shades of gray, but I'm not going to distinguish between these terms. These terms are going to be used interchangeably. And the general concept is really applicable to any data storage or movement uh, unit, like caches, SSDs, main memory, network, controllers. You can do computation in all of those places, except today we don't as much. Some places maybe you have some computation, but it's still a more processor-centric paradigm. Uh, we're going to focus a lot on main memory because I think it's a, a bit more difficult than other places. Uh, caches are so close to the processor, you can do computation there. SSDs, they have their own ecosystem, you can do computation there. Network devices, yes, you can do computation there. But main memory is kind of uh, no man's land. When I actually motivate main memory, why it has been ignored for a long time, I say processor designers drew the uh, boundary uh, over here, storage folks drew the boundary over here, and main memory always fell in between. People really didn't think about it as much. And the interfaces that we have in main memory are, uh, in my opinion, less flexible today. Okay, let's talk about the system uh, level pool. Uh, data access is a major bottleneck today. We're gonna quantify it with several examples. Applications are increasingly data hungry. Energy consumption is a key limiter. And data movement energy dominates com computation energy today, especially true for off-chip to on-chip movement. And we have these applications that require more and more data, uh, as well as its movement. So the big challenge is we want high performance, energy efficiency, and sustainability at the same time. I think sustainability is important because uh, the, the power of computing is growing uh, increasingly, especially data centers. It's not clear if this is really sustainable to build all of these data centers and uh, suck all of the world's power into the data centers. So the problem is that data access is the major performance and energy bottleneck. But our current design principles cause great energy waste uh, because we're not handling data access correctly. And I'll put in parentheses great performance loss over here because we've tried to mitigate this performance loss by building hierarchies and techniques to overcome uh, the issues we have with data access. As a result, systems have become very complex and that has in turn caused even more energy waste in the system. And I think if we have to nail down the problem, the problem is really processing of data is performed far away from the data. Uh, we're moving a lot of data to a place that centralized the processor uh, to do the processing. And if we go back, this is von Neumann 70 years ago. This is a seminal paper that introduced the von Neumann architecture. Uh, basically, there are three key components to a computing system. You have computation units, communication units, and storage memory units. And we've done a lot on all, but we've done a lot more on the processor side. Basically, today's computing systems are overwhelmingly centric uh, in the processor. They're processor centric. All data is processed in the processor. And when I say processor, now it cont contains the accelerators also, GPUs, any kind of accelerator. Some people say they're not von Neumann, but they're absolutely von Neumann from my perspective, basically. They still obey that sequential execution paradigm that they have, and they're on the other side. They still have the memory. Uh, memory versus processing paradigm uh, separated from each other. Uh, so accelerators are included in the computing unit from my perspective. So all data is processed over here at great system cost. And processor is heavily optimized and it's considered the master. That's true for the accelerator of choice that you may have, like a video encoding unit. Uh, data storage units are dumb and they're largely unoptimized, except for the ones that are on the processor die. There's been a lot of attention given, on, given to the caches, for example. Yet. We've covered some of this. Uh, it's the memory stupid. This is the uh, paper that I mentioned by Dick Seitz that said, we built this Alpha 21 to 64 processor to retire, to finish four instructions per cycle, yet it's finishing one instruction every four cycles. Why? It's waiting for memory. Fast forward, as I said, my PhD thesis, processor is waiting for memory more than 50% of the time. And this is the, uh, this is the graph I promised to you. This is from Google's recent paper, recent 2015 where they analyze their, they claim all the data center workloads plus some spec workloads, and they show that the processor is doing useful work only 10% of the time. Most of the time, it's backend bound, it's waiting for data to come back from memory. So that's, we've covered the, we, we basically covered 30 years of processor design, and processors are still waiting for memory more than 50% of the time. This doesn't mean that performance has not improved. Performance has improved, no question about that. There's been a lot of improvement in the processor space, but fundamentally, we're bottlenecked by data. And uh, very quickly, uh, the processor centric, yes? Yeah, 
this is in main memory, yeah. Yeah, it's basically, you're basically waiting for the caches. This, is, this doesn't, uh, yeah. Well, they don't, they don't break it down. They basically look at performance counters and they say the processor is stalled because it's waiting for data. They don't, they don't, say exa they don't go into the details of exactly how you would improve it. Exactly, yeah, you would be waiting. But th they don't go into the detail. This is basically a commodity system. Like, I think they used Intel Skylake at the time. Well, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it. Yeah, we, do, we don't know necessarily, right? We do, uh, it's, it's very hard to uh, pinpoint if it is it bandwidth, is it latency. But basically, the end result is that the processor is stalling, waiting for the data to come back. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so uh, basically, we have a grossly imbalanced system. Uh, because processing is done in only one place, and there is no other choice. Uh, we have to do it in the processor. Everything else just moves and stores data. As a result, data moves a lot. This is energy inefficient because data moves a lot. This is low performance because data moves a lot, and this is also complex. And this leads to an overly complex and bloated processor and accelerators because now they need to be designed to tolerate the data access from memory. Whether it's caused by latency bottleneck or bandwidth bottleneck, it doesn't matter. The processor is designed to tolerate the, that waiting, right? And we've designed very complex hierarchies, those all many levels of caches, prefetchers, multi, massive amounts of multi-threading in GPUs, for example. These memory controllers that are sophisticated, they all add uh, sophistication. And as a result, this increased the energy inefficiency. This increased the performance loss, potentially, because you could otherwise use those things for some other processing mechanisms. And it's also complex. And as a result, we have this picture that I showed you yesterday, right? Most of the system is dedicated to storing and moving data as opposed to doing processing. So the energy perspective I've already shown you as well. Uh, this is from uh, Dali's keynote, and you could argue with all of these numbers. With some technology assumptions, a 64-bit double precision floating point operation is 20 picojoules. A DRAM read or write is 16 nanojoules. You could improve both, and there's a lot more potential for improving this one. But still, this is about three orders of magnitude difference because this thing is far away, right? And also you go through a huge interconnects as we discussed earlier. Okay, uh, and if you actually want to look at some more realistic number than the one I, that I exaggerated to be 1,000x, uh, people have shown numbers uh, like 115 times. Uh, basically a memory access cost two to three orders of magnitude uh, of the energy of an, of, a, of an ad operation. And I'm going to talk about these SOCs a little bit more in a little bit. And we've done some studies, I'm gonna talk about this paper. Uh, in, in a little bit more detail, this was published in ASPLOS this year, where we looked at four major workloads that are used in Android devices and Chromebooks. And we saw that basically 60% 60, 60 60 plus uh, of the total system energy is spent on the data moment in these real workloads. We're gonna get back to this. So there, this leads to a huge energy waste in the end. I think the, <laughs> the title says it all. We do not want to move data. <laughs> If you, if you want to be energy efficient, there is no, you don't want to move the data. So what do we want to do? We, we, we basically need a paradigm shift to enable computation with minimal data movement and compute where it makes sense, as opposed to where the data resides, as opposed to only in a single place uh, that's possible, which is the processor or the accelerator. In other words, make computing architectures more data centric. And that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, this means that data can reside anywhere. It could mean it could reside in the storage, it could reside in the network, it could reside in the caches. We want to have primitives to be able to do computation wherever the data resides, as opposed to being restricted to doing it only in the processor or the accelerator today. If you don't have those primitives, we have to move the data. There is no other choice. Okay, so memory is definitely interesting because memory is a bit harder in terms of the interfaces. That's why we want to look at processing inside the memory, or as I said, this near data processing close to the memory is also fine. But this is at a high level what we would like to do. Memory will store a lot of data, like a database, graphs, media, whatever you would like to operate on. And the processor is able to query memory by sending functions, asking memory to do a search, for example, inside a database. 
And then the memory re returns some results, perhaps approximate, perhaps full. And then the processor can keep interacting with the memory through this high-level interface with query response interface. Basically, the processor can execute functions inside the memory also if the memory is capable of doing so. So clearly, the interfaces we have to memory that we've discussed doesn't accomplish that, right? Today, we cannot talk to memory and say, memory, can you execute this function for me, query for me? Today, we talk to memory saying, memory, do this read at the specific address, do this write to the specific address, and maybe refresh uh, whatever I don't know you're refreshing. So there are many questions over here, clearly, because this is really changing the paradigm now. How do you design the compute-capable memory, this thing over here, and the controllers? How do you design the processor chip uh, given this, as well as the in-memory units over here. How do you design the software and hardware interfaces? Because neither of them are capable of doing this today. How do you design the system software and languages? And how do you design the algorithms? Because if you have computation capability over here, maybe the algorithms you design are completely different right now. And we're going to discuss that in specific examples that I'm going to give. So it's really a problem that spans the entire stack. You need to think about devices, how to perform this computation efficiently. You need to think about the algorithms, how to adapt uh, the problems to the computation mechanisms that are provided by the devices. And you need to have the right interfaces. And you need to have uh, design everything over here such that things can be expressed and exploited uh, underneath. So that's the idea. It's not an easy problem. That's why we're going to switch between multiple things uh, across the stack uh, during this lecture. But it's fun. Basically, to uh, uh, recap it, uh, this is an old idea. Actually, in the general purpose domain, the first paper that I know of is by Harold Stone in 1970, IEEE, IEEE Transactions on Computers. He called it a logic in memory computer. He basically proposed putting a, putting a, a processor inside the memory, which was an idea well ahead of its time, right? And then later, there, were, there was a non-one database machine uh, uh, by David Elliott Shaw. He basically said, oh, you, you should... You should actually do processing inside the memory. And then later, there was IRAM work. There was a lot of works in the 1990s. Uh, FlexRAM is one from Illinois. Uh, computational RAM. There are a lot of ideas over there. And none of them really took off, uh, partially because the environment was not right, in my opinion. I have a quick question. Yes. <laughs> you also mentioned a possible successor. That's right, yeah. That was our also. <laughs> sure. That's true, yes. Yeah, there are cases where, yeah, I think, yeah, exactly, clusters of things. <laughs> this is this is like the history of parallel computing, also, right? The large-scale parallel machines—they were always there, but they really weren't there until the GPUs <laughs> took over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I agree. Yes, there there are instances where things were employed. Actually, some of the other uh, prototypes were um, um, also built and used, but they they died yeah. over time. They didn't really survive. But today. <laughs> Yeah, so today, I think there's a huge push from technology. As, as I said, the, the DRAM scaling is at jeopardy, and we covered that a lot in the previous lectures. And we have controllers close to DRAM. Industry is open to new memory architectures. This is one example. You have 3D stack logic and memory. High, high bandwidth memory already exists. Fundamentally, it can be 3D stack like this. And we're going to talk about 3D stack memory. And people have been experimenting with very limited <coughs> forms of processing inside the DRAM chip. Uh, I think this is very limited, but this is an example of a prototype chip that people have built. Uh, and there is a huge push from, pull from systems and applications because data access is a big bottleneck, systems are energy limited, and data movement is much more energy hungry. So this is the summary. Now let's talk about how we can actually enable this. I don't think putting a processor inside a DRAM chip is going to be the answer because you design this processor for a completely different purpose than putting it inside the DRAM chip. You should really do something else today, in my opinion. So I'm going to talk about two different directions that we have been examining and other people have been looking at. But this first one is very interesting because surprisingly not many people have looked at it. I think with emerging technologies, people are looking at it more. But with DRAM, there is very little work that we have found uh, in the past uh, related to this. If you find something, I'd love to know, of course. So I'm going to talk about this one first with a focus on DRAM. Some of the ideas are applicable to other technologies also. I'm not going to cover new technologies yet. OK, so the basic idea is very simple. Uh, a memory technology like DRAM has great capability to perform bulk data movement and computation internally with very little changes. Uh, because you can exploit internal connectivity to move the data, and you can exploit the analog computation capability that's present inside the DRAM. And I'm going to give you some examples over here. I'm going to start by cheating. 
and not even talk about computation. I'm going to talk about data movement, which is data copy and initialization. So we use these primitives in many applications. You copy one page to another page. You do copy on write in operating systems, for example, whenever you fork a process. You initialize pages before you use them for many reasons. And people have been writing papers for a long time that these things are important for operating system performance. Uh, and yeah, there are interesting papers that talk about this. And there is some support that was provided in the memory controller by folks at Intel. Uh, but that was still in the processor-centric paradigm because the memory controller does the data movement. Uh, it's an important problem. So, and it's used in many applications, data copy and initialization. For example, it's very important for security. All operating systems have a zero page pool that I know of. They, they uh, zero the pages and then supply them to processes that need it. Forking leads to copy on writes, checkpointing, virtual machine cloning and deduplication, and many other things, page migration. These are all page copies. And the same Google paper that I mentioned earlier uh, uh, basically showed that 5% of the cycles in Google's entire data center is spent on these two system calls, memmove and memcopy. I think this is a large number for two system calls. This is not the, all of the page copies. I like this 5% number because sometimes, things, uh, sometimes people think these, this 5% number is not uh, very large. I think it's very large across a large uh, scale. And my, my anecdote over here is uh, there was a time in architecture, computer architecture, where people were doing these really small tweaks in processor design and they were getting 30%, 40% power reduction in the processor. And I think at the same time, Intel was saying there is no component of the processor that consumes more than 5% of the power. So there's a disparity between academia and industry, I think, <laughs> which is really interesting. So this 5% is really big. <laughs> and this is not the source of all of the data copy and initialization. It's just these two function calls. Okay, so how do we do bulk data copy? I'll, I'll pick data copy because data initialization is a special case of data copy, right? You initialize some row and then you keep copying to some other place that uh, basically is a co initialization converted into a copy. Uh, how do we do a bulk data copy today? If we want to copy the source page to this destination page, let's say a small page, four kilobytes, we have to go through the processor today. You bring the source page byte by byte all the way into the L1. You bring the destination page byte by byte all the way into the L1. Do the write and then return, write back the destination page byte by byte back into memory. Now this is high latency because you do a lot of data movement. Uh, high bandwidth utilization. While you're using the bus for this, somebody else cannot use the bus. Cache pollution, because you bring the data into the caches, but you could eliminate this today by doing this through the DMA, direct memory access engine. So this part at least we can save potentially, but the real big part we cannot save. And the a lot of unwanted data movement. Maybe you're doing this copy and you're not going to use that page for a long time, right? Uh, or maybe you're not going to use most of the page. Why are you bringing all of that into, into the processor? So basically with some technology assumptions, if you want to do this four kilobyte page copy via the direct memory access engine, not going through the on-chip hierarchy, it takes about 1,000 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules. I'm going to uh, show you a mechanism called row clone that will do it better. Basically, we would like to be able to have the option to do this, not necessarily do it all the time inside the memory, but we'd like to be able to tell the memory controller, memory controller do, tell the memory to do this copy internally without disturbing anybody else in the system. We don't have this option today. If we have this option, then we can decide whether or not to use it. And the idea is this is low latency because we're going to exploit the internal connectivity uh, in memory. This is low bandwidth utilization. Actually, if you don't move anything here, this is zero bandwidth utilization and someone else can actually use that bus. No cache pollution, but you could eliminate that today also. And no unwanted data moment. And I'm going to show you a mechanism that takes this 1,046 nanoseconds, in the best case, to 90 nanoseconds, and 3.6 microjoules to 0 0.04 microjoules. And if you optimize it, actually, you can get it down to 70 nanoseconds or so with the same technology assumptions. And the idea is very simple, actually. This is called row clone. If the source and destination page are in the same DRAM subarray, you can use the row buffer as a temporary buffer to move to copy the source into and to copy the source out of into the destination. So I've already given you the idea. Basically, the idea consists of two activations. In the first activation, you activate the source row, which brings the data into the row buffer. In the second step, you activate the destination row, which implicitly deactivates the source row, but keeps the contents of the source row in the row buffer. 
And once you activate the destination row, the row buffer starts driving its contents into the destination. That's the idea, using basic chart sharing and uh, driving principles through the row buffer because each cell in the row buffer is much stronger than each cell over here in the UM. That's the idea. It's very simple. You cannot do it in existing chips. I wish we, we, we wanted to find a chip where you could do it, but you couldn't do it in existing chips, and it requires very little modification to the chips. Mikamono, I, I think, right? Mikamono? Is that the name? Okay, maybe there is a different one. He has many kanji. Okay, I see. <laughs> many kanji. Yeah, yeah, I think we're, we're, we are thinking about the same thing. I know the patents from that. But here, we're, uh, we're not even talking about adding any other logic. This already exists in DRAM. This is really, really negligible hardware cost. And I know some of, some of their work, actually, uh, by doing uh, in DRAM computations. Uh, yeah. So basically, this is the intra subarray version of the uh, row clone. It's very simple. Basically, this is what's happening. You connect the source to the row buffer. And I've shown you an example of this before. What happens is sense amplifier stores the data and then refills this. And then you disconnect this. Sense amplifier still stores the data in the so that was connected by the source. And then you connect the destination. And the sense amplifier simply drives whatever data it's stored into the destination. No, no additional circuitry, basically. You just need to have two consecutive activates, and the second activate implicitly deactivates the source. And I think I've given enough of this, so. Okay, so this is nice, but this requires source and destination to be in the same subarray. If you ensure that, that's great. And aligned. And aligned, yes, and aligned, of course. And also, uh, I mean, of course, if you're doing a page copy and if your page is four kilobytes, if your row is eight kilobytes, you're really copying more than a page. So there are issues like that, which I'm not going to discuss. Uh, those are hairy issues, I think. Interleaving also affects this, interleaving across the, ch if you interleave across the channels, now your granularity of copy also increases. So there's an ecosystem that needs to be developed to enable this in a much better way uh, than current systems are designed, because current systems are designed without this in mind. <laughs> if you actually have this in mind, maybe you design the system in a different way. Uh, okay, so if you want to do copy uh, more generally inside the DRAM chip, uh, if the source page is in this bank and the destination page is, it should be in this bank, you can actually use a shared internal bus. This requires slightly more modification, but fundamental uh, circuitry to do this exists. What you can do is you can put this bank to a read mode, you can put this bank to write mode, and basically, oh, yeah, this is the HDMI connection, or, okay, that's better. <laughs> you basically pipeline the accesses to, uh, for, while reading from this byte by byte, you're writing to this byte by byte. And this, this already exists, you just need to do it internally inside the DRAM chip. All of the circuitry exists. So that's the interbank copy. Of course this takes longer, because you're moving the data a little bit farther away. The data is not in the same subarray, which is subarray is over here, right? Uh, and you, you don't move the data further. Here, you're moving it inside the DRAM chip through some interconnect. You're not moving off chip, so it's still faster than off chip. So you can see that the latency reduction of a four kilobyte page copy is about two X, and energy reduction, memory energy reduction is about three X. And this is the generalized mechanism. Basic intra subarray is only two activates like this. Inter, inter bank copy, pipeline internal read or write. The worst case is if the source and destination are in different subarrays. Now, there's no way to connect these subarrays, but we're going to talk about something later on to actually change the DRAM microarchitecture to connect those subarrays. Um, leave, I'll leave it uh, for that. But if you actually want to do this without changing the interconnections between the subarrays, what we propose in this paper is you copy the source page to a destination bank, to, to a temporary place in some other bank, and then you, you, you take whatever you copied over there and put it into this subarray. Of course, this is not ideal and it's not that great, but this saves energy. It doesn't save performance. <coughs> okay, all of this, all of these mechanisms have very little area cost according to our calculations. Uh, and initialization, as I said, is a special case of copy. If you actually are, are doing a lot of initialization, you may actually want to fix a row at all zeros in DRAM. It, it leads to a small loss in capacity. 
actually, you may actually change the sense amplifier to be able to do that also, which I'm not going to talk about over here. But basically, and then copy it uh, to different rows. If you're initializing your entire memory to all zeros, for example, you just need to do copying. And maybe there are other primitives that you can develop in DRAM to do that zeroing more easily. And these are the results that we find uh, based on bulk initialization. Uh, zero initialization is the most common. You reserve a row and copy data from the reserved uh, row. And this leads to 6x lower latency and 41x lower DRAM energy. And this is the summary of the results. So basically, uh, your savings are heterogeneous depending on where the source and destination pages are. Intrasubray subarray is the, at least the largest latency reduction, 11x or so, and largest memory energy reduction. This should be memory energy. It's not the entire system energy, about 74x. Interbank is still not bad, but as you can see, there's a huge difference between these two because moving, you're moving data slightly more. And energy is still good. Inter-subarray with these techniques, it doesn't buy you a latency reduction, but it buys you some energy reduction. And this is the zero initialization uh, results. Okay. So we've also looked at real workloads. Actually, when the paper was first rejected, they said, oh, why aren't you lo looking at spec? Because spec actually doesn't do a lot of these copies. So you should actually look at the workloads that exercise the thing that you're studying. Sometimes the viewers don't necessarily understand that, but it's important. And these were workloads that we had that exercised things, like boot up actually does a lot of zero initialization, for example, a lot of copying. Forking, it's a micro benchmark, yes, but it does a lot of copying on write. Uh, and shell, when you're running some shell script, you actually do a lot of initialization copying also. And different uh, workloads also have. And I, I'm sure there are other workloads that we didn't examine because of our infrastructure limitations. And it turns out if you use row clone with them, you get significant performance improvement. This is for boot up, this is the performance improvement, and this is the energy reduction. As you can see, they're significant. Fork is very much bottlenecked uh, by initialization. And, uh, and the performance and energy improvements correlate with how much uh, data copy and initialization that these workloads are doing. Okay, so I think the idea is very simple. Any questions? But even an idea like, uh, yes, Avi. Where do I reserve some S clones for SMK? Mm -hmm. That's the sense amplifiers. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, sometimes you have a, or is there any manner to show where mm -hmm. there are S clones for CPU or CPU to save up to the CPU and the So we, we are using the sense amplifiers. I think that's that may be what you're referring to. There were some DRAMs in the past called cache DRAM. They had a bigger SRAM structure, but they didn't survive because that was very costly. If you have that, yes, you can use that also, those cache DRAM structures. Yeah, yeah. You could. I mean, if you if you have some structure in the memory controller, you could. But as far as I know, uh, you don't buffer huge pages inside okay, inside the DRAM. But then you have to move to the DRAM memory controller. Yeah, that's the yeah. downside. Right? We don't want to even. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that was some of the proposals that I mentioned. Uh, copied and pasted Ravi Iyer's papers. They say basically, let's do that in the memory controller. But we don't even want to do it in the memory controller. Okay. So even an idea like this. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could potentially, right? You could, uh, yeah, we haven't examined that. You could potentially copy to multiple rows. I think in the end, you would be limited by the drive of your sense amplifiers. My feeling is you could actually copy to multiple. You need a primitive that says uh, activate multiple rows. And actually, I'm going to talk about that primitive, but we didn't use it for copy. I like that idea. I believe you could do multiple. Uh, that's right, yes. That's right, yes. So I think the complexity is over there in the row decoders, but maybe you can do, you, you can you can have tricks like limit the partitioning and yeah, maybe you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like that idea. We didn't explore that. My, my feeling is you could do multiple and as long as you can activate multiple. But what's the limit? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so 
even an idea like this requires end-to-end -end system design. Yes, this may require very little modification to DRAM, but applications need to communicate these bulk copy initializations all the way into the DRAM. The good thing is some ISAs already have this. x86, for example, has repeat MoS, and you could actually translate all the way into the memory controller, which is good. But if, you, if your ISA doesn't have the support, then uh, you cannot do it, of course. Uh, and of course, you need to actually find the st space in the application to convert them uh, here. Uh, there are other issues, like how do you ensure cache coherence? That's important. Uh, I mean, these issues arise when you're doing operations inside the DMA, copying through the DMA also. So we use a similar uh, solution to this, but you can always do better. And this is going to be a more bigger issue if you do processing in memory, if you're doing modifying data inside the memory, and if you're, the processor is also modifying memory. How do you ensure cache coherence? Especially if cache coherence needs to be checked across a bus that's very limited in terms of bandwidth. Today, we do cache coherence on a chip. It's already complicated, but the bandwidth of cache coherence is very high within the chip. If you go off chip, the bandwidth is, of course, lower. So we're going to have similar issues. Uh, how do you maximize latency and energy savings? So somebody needs to be aware of this structure of the DRAM so that you can allocate a destination page in the same subarray as the source page. If you're doing copy on write, for example, you know exactly when you're allocating the destination page. If the operating system knows the structure of the DRAM where the subarray is, it can allocate the destination from the same subarray, assuming it has an intelligent page, page allocation algorithm. But today, we don't have any exposure to the internals of the DRAM. The operating system doesn't know the subarray structure of DRAM. Right? So that needs to be communicated to someone. And, and who does that? to maximize the latency and energy savings. Yes? Inter-subarray, like between two different subarrays. Yeah, uh, if, you, if you're intelligent in your allocation, maybe, yes. <laughs> it's possible, yes. Uh, but yeah, basically, you know, you take the traffic not necessarily. That's right, yeah. Exactly, yeah. If, if, you, if you know that structure, yes. But if you don't know that, then who knows where a page physical address maps in memory, right? They may go, as well go to different subarray. So there needs to be a better interface that exposes the internals of the DRAM to all the way to the operating system or whoever is doing the memory allocation in this case. And of course, in the end, uh, there's this question of how do you handle data reuse, right? Because sometimes you may want some of the data back in the caches. Sometimes you don't. And how do you actually handle that. This is an open question. The paper has some ideas, but I'm not going to go into the details of it. So even a simple idea like this is, uh, opens up system level issues, as you can see. And I think these are more general issues with processing in memory. There are more issues beyond this, but these are some important issues. If you're doing, maybe it's not bulk copy initialization, but function call, right? If you're doing a function call inside memory, how do you communicate that to memory? What are the interfaces? What are the models? So this, so I already showed you this one, so I'm going to skip this. And this is the paper. If you're interested, you can take a look at it. And I, as I said, I've cheated. This is just copy and initialization, but it's important. It exists in applications. Uh, so can you do better? Question. So yes. The, memo, the mapping of addresses to the array is not, is not fully configured. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned you wanted the eight mm -hmm. bytes to go to the buses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it means that it's not necessarily the, the row. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I am, I, if I am want to enter the page, but it's not necessarily. Maybe in general. Yeah, yeah, it may be. Yeah. Different row buffers. Exactly. So, so how that? Yeah, yeah. How do you so this? yeah, yeah. That's that's what I mentioned when I said interleaving. So if you if you're doing cache block interleaving, for example, across the banks and channels. Yeah. Uh, now a contiguous page resides in many banks and many channels. And if you're doing row clone, essentially you need to copy across all of them. So this doesn't go well with cache block interleaving. Uh, so your granularity increases basically. Uh, your, your granularity may be, you, want, you may want to copy only four kilobytes, but you may have to copy 16 kilobytes, for example. And that needs to be, of course, now you need to be cognizant of that. And there are some cases where you may not be able to do the copy because of that. So I think that interleaving, mapping, that's why it's very hairy. Whenever you're doing uh, in-memory computation, you should really think about better interleaving mechanisms. So I think row interleaving is a much more friendly interleaving mechanism for this, for example. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. I think that's that's really important, actually. Yeah. If we if we have the current mindset, okay, this is how the system is designed, and we want to put processing and memory on top of that without changing anything else, that's not going to work. We have to really reconsider how things are mapped. We have to really reconsider how things are communicated. Yeah, I think these are really, really good problems. Okay, so basically, I think the thinking is, we're thinking of memory as an accelerator that's good at doing whatever it's good at doing. We have, we're designing all these accelerators over here, and we're very good at them. We're gonna talk about some of them maybe later on. But they're all sitting on the wrong side of the memory bus, on the left side over here, as you can see. They're all bottlenecked by the same thing. Why don't we actually design accelerators over here that are good at what this part is very good at doing? And treat that as, similarly to a conventional accelerator, maybe have a similar programming model, I don't know. And that's the, key, that's the basic idea over here. So I'm going to tell you more. Uh, basically, similarly, we can support, well, we can support these things, but similarly, we can support and or not and majority. I'm going to talk about that at low cost. These are built bitwise operations. And we're going to use the analog computation capability of DRAM. And the idea will be very simple. We want to activate multiple rows to perform computation. And I'm going to show you benefits for these bitwise operations, 30 to 60x performance and energy improvements. And this was finally published recently. Uh, I think I'm not going to talk about this in this lecture, but new memory technologies enable even more opportunities, in my opinion. Memristors, resistor RAM, phase change memory, STTM RAM, some of the research is going on over here at Technion, especially on memristors. Uh, these enable even more opportunities for two reasons. One is they can operate with minimal, operate on data of min minimal movement because fundamentally, whenever you access the RAM, you destroy the data over there. You have to fundamentally move data to operate on it. There is no other way in DRAM as far as I know, uh, at least in existing technologies in DRAM. But these technologies, you may not have to move data because they're non-volatile. You don't destroy the data whenever you access it. Second, these technologies, the mindset is not set. <laughs> I hope not, at least. Whereas in DRAM, the mindset is very <laughs> set in a very ugly way, in my perspective. People are, are actually have really bound themselves to this uh, very narrow mind. Whereas the, with these new technologies, hopefully people are open in terms of putting other stuff inside the memory chip. So I think that's, that's the second difference. And that may be the bigger difference compared to the real technological differences. Yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Three, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think if you can do it, and if it, if it buys you benefits, sure, I think. I think it needs to be evaluated. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about this first part over here. Basically, uh, the, uh, the, the primitive that we're going to use is going to be simple. It's called triple row activation. And if you actually consider these cells in rows, basically three rows, A, B, C, but I'm showing you one cell uh, from each row over here. If you had the primitive to concurrently activate all of these three rows, in an ideal circuit, you would get a bitwise majority. Basically, if at least two of these are charged, you would get the charge state in the sense amplifier. If at least two of these are discharged, you get the discharge state. So that's a simple bitwise majority function. It's a beautiful function. You could do many things with bitwise majority itself. Uh, but you could rewrite this also as, uh, in a, you could rewrite this Boolean equation and use C as a control input. And if C is one, you get the OR of A and B. If C is zero, you get the end of A and B. Essentially now you have bitwise end and bitwise OR implemented by controlling one of the rows. Of course, it's bulk bitwise. It's not just sing single bit. You're operating on whatever your row length is. Now, this is good because you can do bit bulk bitwise AND and NOT, but AND and NOT by itself or majority by themselves are not functionally complete, and we want to make them functionally complete. How do you make them functionally complete? You need a NOT somewhere. 
well, I guess before we move to not, <laughs> let's see how you can actually expose them. This is one way of exposing this. Uh, bulk and, for example, performs a bitwise, perform a bitwise end of two rows A and B and store the result in row C. So what we do in implementation, if you actually are able to enable this triple row activation in the entire array, that's a mess. Then you need a lot of row decoders, and that's not good. So we reserve, actually, designated rows as part of the array for triple row activation, and we do triple row activation only in those rows. And we also reserve a zero row for, and one row to be able to do end and uh, or uh, separately. So what we do is if uh, there's a row uh, that, uh, with address A, we clone it using row clone into one of these designated rows. We clone row B into one of the designated rows. And then we clone the zero row into the other designated row because we want to do an AND. And AND requires, if you go back to this Boolean equation, uh, C uh, to be zero, as you can see. And then you can do activate, triple row activate. That's the primitive. And then the result is in any of these rows now because that's how chart sharing works. And you row clone one of these rows into the destination row C. That's the idea. This is with minimal impact to the array. Otherwise, you have to have a lot of row decoders to do this triple row activation. Do you want to do it in the row C uh, first? Yeah, basically, because of chart sharing, whenever you do the computation, your result overwrites all of those rows. Yeah, D1 and D2 are lost, but they're, they're the same as D3. <laughs> That's why you need to do the cloning. <laughs> That's why I have, you have to copy every time. Exactly, you have to copy every time. And all of these overheads will be accounted for uh, when I describe the results. So you cannot get away without cloning. So DRAM, because of the destructive nature of DRAM, whenever you do this analog computation, you destroy the source also. OK, uh, so yeah, we need not. And this is the knot. Knot is not as easy, unfortunately. It already exists, actually. If you look at, uh, basically, we are going to add this into the DRAM. But if you look at the sense amplifier, let's say you, uh, you enabled some row over here. That row's value is over here, or that cell's value is over here. But the cell's complement is in bit line bar on the other end of the sense amplifier, basically. And we're going to use that. We're going to feed that to a special row called this dual contact cell row uh, by taking the bit line bar and injecting back into the special row. And that's the basic idea. It adds a little bit of overhead, clearly, because you add the special row and you add this interconnect going into the uh, DRAM row. But it's not that bad. It's only one row that we're adding. And we don't add any logic. There's no NOT gate inserted anywhere, because NOT gate already exists, actually, over here. So that's the idea. So this is not as nice, but it exists. Well, it, it doesn't exist. It's, I, I believe it's doable. And this basically shows uh, what happens. Uh, like, how do you copy, basically? You, you first activate uh, this row, which brings the data into the sense amplifier. And then you feed the data from the sense amplifier back into this dual contact cell. As a result, dual contact cell has the complement of the row that you read. And the dual contact cell can be copied anywhere now. That's the idea. OK. So more details in the, all of the analysis, circuit level analysis in the paper. So what is the benefit that you get? This is just in comparison to some uh, like servers at the time. Uh, uh, this paper got rejected many times, so people didn't like the idea. Uh, because they said, basically, the, they said, DI manufacturers will never do this, so you should not publish this. Of course, if you never publish it, DI manufacturers will never do it. I agree. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very chicken and the egg problem. That's <laughs> And eventually, it got published after five tries <laughs> at Micro, <laughs> which is good. We'll see if DUI manufacturers will do it. But a lot of people have built uh, on top of the work. So I think this mindset is, not, uh, is driving some people crazy. <laughs> not me necessarily, but a lot of people are not, are not very happy about this mindset. OK, uh, so if, if someone decides to do this, what is the benefit they could potentially get? So this is our results. We actually compared to hybrid memory cube which is a 3D, a 3D logic and DRAM structure. And AMBIT is the name of the mechanism. And AMBIT 3D assumes the same number of banks uh, as the hybrid memory cube if you implement it on top of that. And that's the best uh, incarnation of AMBIT. If you look at this with the, with the technology assumptions, with a single DRAM module, you can essentially do two teranauts per second without moving data out of the chip. And an OR, you get similar, but a little bit less throughput. NAND and NOR, your throughput reduces, of course, because you're actually doing NOT and AND, and we optimize that also. XOR, XNOR, your throughput reduces a little bit more. 
and this is the average if you care about the average across all of those things. And these were some mechanisms we compared to. This is Intel Skylake. Uh, this is not a powerful GPU. Okay. And these are the energy numbers. I think maybe you can argue with the performance numbers because you could always add more memory bandwidth to the GPU, uh, more uh, SIMD units, but you're limited by the memory bandwidth in the end in the GPU. And you could increase this part. I don't think you could ever match this part uh, unless you get, in, you get the GPU inside the uh, DRAM chip. That's right, it's proportional to the row size. It's proportional to how many subarrays you could do this in parallel at, uh, I think the row size that we had was eight kilobytes in this case. And the reason that you get higher throughput uh, in Ambit versus Ambit 3D is basically you have more subarrays in Ambit 3D. That's the only difference basically. And this is something that you cannot get uh, even if you increase the memory bandwidth. This is basically the energy reduction. This comes because you're not moving the data as much. And not, in terms of not, the energy reduction is 60x in terms of nanojoules per kilobyte. And of course, energy reduction reduces as you compound these operations. XOR, XNOR is still 25x. Okay. And I'm going to skip this because this is reiterating the thing. So now let's, yes. That's right. The power numbers, they should be in the paper. But if not, it's in Vivek's thesis. But yes, power increases, of course. The DRAM power. And that's a trade off. Um, so that's a good question. <laughs> I think that depends on your power budget. <laughs> DRAM is usually not very power hungry. In this case, you're putting computation inside the DRAM, so you will definitely have a spike in power, no question about that. I think the more than the power concerns, I think uh, that power draw may affect your reliability in the DRAM cells, and that's something we cannot easily evaluate. We've evaluated the effect of uh, this uh, uh, triple row activation in terms of the reliability of the DRAM cells. We run a lot of simulations in terms of circuits, and if uh, Basically, depending on the variation that you have in the circuitry, at some point you start getting errors. So uh, this could actually be used as an approximate substrate also. We didn't exploit it that way. But yes, I think that's, that's a real concern. And that needs to be rethought also, the power consumption. Yeah, yeah I think that's... Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think if you... If you <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. Basically... The current system designs will not work if you're doing aggressive processing in memory. You'll need to rethink how we actually cool the system. But I think that's a very good point. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so let's take the application viewpoint. So we've designed a substrate that can do bulk bitwise operations very nicely. Who takes advantage of it? This was one of the other issues that the reviewers had. There are no applications that take advantage of it, even though we demonstrated that there are applications. Uh, I think it's, as a reviewer, it's good to have a positive mindset <laughs> because if you have a substrate like this, there will be applications that take advantage of it. And we've actually shown several applications. So bitmap indices are a very good example. I'm going to talk about bit weaving. And actually, people are designing web search engines that are operating on bit, uh, at the bit level. This is Microsoft's web search engine, BitFunnel, so that they could use GPUs and FPGAs. DNA sequence mapping that we worked on actually that uses a lot of the ambit-like principles to accelerate DNA sequence mapping. A lot of encryption algorithms operate at the bit level and set operations that are described in the paper. And there's more, I think. Uh, clearly, if your application doesn't really fit this bulk bitwise model, it's not going to benefit from this. Uh, but if you make your application fit this bulk bitwise model, it can benefit a lot. Uh, so bitmap indices are one example. This is actually used in many databases uh, because uh, this basically converts B trees and their variants to simple bitwise operations. For example, if you want to search for uh, people who are within an age range, you can represent uh, that inside the database with a bitmap, a huge bitmap. And if you want to actually search for people within that age uh, range, plus people who are earning some amount of salary, plus people who are attending Technion, plus people who are from some places, basically now that's a that's a huge bitwise and across these bit vectors. Right. And that's the idea. 
And you can port these bitwise operations into the ambit substrate that I just described. And these are some of the results that you get uh, with, the, with some of the queries. I'm not going to go into the details of the queries. The paper has more details. But this is the execution time of the query. Uh, as you can see, the uh, performance improvements, uh, the latency of the query reduces by 5 to 6.6x in this case. And actually, uh, as the data set size increases, the latency reduction also increases. Maybe not that much, but it's, it's still not bad. People are actually designing databases uh, not just with bitmap indices, but with a lot of bitwise operations. They want to just use bitwise operations as much as possible. This bit viewing database from uh, Wisconsin, uh, from Jignesh Patel's group, that was designed around 2012 or so. And their goal was to basically uh, use the SIMD engines as well as the GPUs to do these really fast bitwise processing. And uh, they, they did column scans using those bitwise uh, representations. And we ported uh, that database on, on top of Ambit. And we saw significant benefits. So this is with just this query, for example, with some number of rows and some number of bits per column. As you can see, the performance benefits, the speed up, uh, is about 12x with the, with the larger data set sizes. Why? Because there are a lot of bitwise operations, and you're doing it uh, pretty much completely inside the memory. So if you're not doing it, uh, if you cannot do something inside memory, of course, now you need to partition. You do as much as possible inside the memory, and you do the rest in the CPU. So you need to partition. So I'm not suggesting that entire database inside memory uh, with these bulk bitwise uh, mechanisms. Yes? So we need, uh, yes, we, well, we, we basically have additional area overhead. No question about that. Basically, we don't have, uh, we have extra rows that we're added, we've added. No, we don't take into account the capacity loss, because it's a very small loss, actually. It's, a, it's less than 1% or so, so maybe 1% to 2%. You spend on the Oh, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. At the application yeah. level. Yeah. So if you're thinking about application level, yes, yes, those are, those are taken into account. I, I thought you were talking about uh, the space inside the DRAM chip. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the application level, yeah, the application is completely rewritten to take advantage of Ambit. No question about that. You, you cannot get benefit if you don't rewrite the application to take advantage of these operations. Yeah. So it's it's basically fixed size of memory. Yeah. But you uh, the the application of course is optimized to take advantage of Ambit. That re that may require more rows. I, I agree with that. Okay. Okay. So there's more in the paper. I'm not going to go into the detail. Uh, uh, th there have been some recent works building on this uh, they, that actually look at how to do this in phase change memory, for example, something like this row clone and bitwise operations. Uh, I think there's a lot more to do in this area. Any more questions? We can take that offline, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> so there's more to do, basically. <laughs> yes? Well, we're, I think we're going to talk about that. So these yeah. show you some examples. But there is a lot. There are a lot of workloads. Uh, Oh, I see. For this, for
for the substrate? I think it really depends. In the end, uh, assuming the substrate gets there, my feeling is a lot of people t will take advantage of it, right? It's a chicken and the egg problem, right? If this is not out there, then people will never think about it. But if it's out there, and if it offers high performance, then people may come up with other applications that they can, or their own applications that they really know of. And Yeah, uh, that, uh, exactly, yeah. It's, it's the same sort of thing. Like if, if, if I didn't have the smartphone, I don't know what applications would go here, and I cannot, and even, even if I may be the best application person in the world, I may not be able to predict what will come. So I think it's really a chicken and the egg problem. Once the technology is over there, people will take advantage of it, from my perspective. And these are things that we could come up with. And we know this part, and we know that this could be done using Ambit, and we, saw these other parts also based on experience. But other people have other experience that they can exploit. But the parallelism here is basically uh, limited by the number of columns. Exactly. So the parallelism is limited by, uh, so the constraint is it's bulk bitwise. Uh, basically, granularity is fixed. And the parallelism is limited by number of columns, number of subarrays, number of banks, how many things that you can concurrently do this? Oh, so you at. Can do it concurrently in every subway. Absolutely, you, you could, assuming you have power. So basically, you could do it on the entire DRAM chip if you're not power limited. Yeah, so you you could have a lot of operations. Right. Basically, all of your subways could be doing this yes. if you're not power and reliability limited. Yeah. Much, much more. Yeah. Exactly, it's not just one subway doing this. So that's why it's, it has a lot of potential. I think, of course, power needs to be solved, but I think we've designed these. CPUs that are consuming a lot of power for the same reason. We could cool DRAM also, as you mentioned. Okay, so I think that's a big challenge and opportunity for the future. How do we enable these computing architectures with minimal data movement? And I'll raise this question. Does memory have to be dumb? <laughs> Today we're treating it as dumb. It should be, <laughs> maybe we should give it much more credit. Okay, so let's switch gears and talk about uh, another direction in exploiting processing in memory. Uh, and that's going to be 3D stacked memory. But now that we're at the one hour mark, uh, do people want to take a break or? What time is our break time? Or does it matter? Maybe we just, okay, maybe we take a break right now since I heard a lot of yes, yeses. How about we come back at 2.25? Does that sound good? 